Hello, Oilers fans. Austin here, and welcome to the day after discussion between the Blues and Oilers. Last night, St. Louis beat Edmonton 3 2 in overtime, and what ended up being a Pretty frustrating game to watch as a fan. Now, you're going to notice my whole overlay graphic settings look a little bit different right now. I am playing around with different overlays, different graphics. Uh, in these day after discussions, there's a few things that I want to be adding. So please leave constructive feedback. But the one thing that I want to have during these videos is the title above, the score below the webcam. And then on the right side of the screen, I want to have the topics of discussion for the video. That way, it's easier for everyone to kind of follow along and kind of know where I am am and what I'm talking about as the video progresses. However, I do understand that this uh, might not look great right now. It is a work in progress, so I do appreciate any constructive feedback that you might have on this specific setup right now. This is not the final setup in terms of how I'm going to have these videos look, but this is something that I am playing around with and I do want to experiment with just a little bit before we get into the playoffs, because once the playoffs start, I want to have everything set up and ready to go. Now, before I get into today's topics and discuss the actual game from last night, if you are new to the channel and you like and, and you and you want to support, make sure you hit like, make sure you hit subscribe. All that good stuff goes a long way in supporting the channel. I do upload daily Oilers content. So if you're an Oilers fan, this is a great place to be. Now, let's get into the topics today. Now, as you can see on the screen, uh, frustrating reviews, dry sidle, officiating standings. Those are the main topics that I'll be discussing after the game last night. So first topic of discussion is frustrating. As a fan, that was an incredibly frustrating game to watch. And not, not just because the reviews didn't go the Oilers way. But just, you know, the flow of the game, the way things were officiated, the the choppiness of the ice, players were falling down, the puck was bouncing everywhere. The, the, the whole flow of the game was just off. And especially in that second period when you did have the reviews, uh, lengthy reviews too. It, it took a lot of time away from actual gameplay. And uh, as a fan, it, it was not a uh, fun game to watch. If, if you're a new hockey fan and that was one of the first games you ever tuned into, I don't imagine anyone would want to keep watching the game of hockey like that would be incredibly frustrating to watch incredibly confusing and um it's tough it was a tough game um i i can't say i enjoyed any moment of the game and things kind of uh went off the rails right at the start before it before the puck even dropped the national anthem that was sung uh the the, the canadian anthem was sung in a very robotic let's just get through this as quickly as possible kind of tone and then they also messed up the canadian anthem's lyrics which seems to happen quite regularly for some reason i don't know how we can't get anthem singers that just understand and know the lyrics to oh canada it's a one and a half minute long song not a big deal but um so right right from the get-go uh there was a lot of fans including myself where i was kind of like okay you know what the, i don't have a good feeling about this this is already completely off the rails um and not to mention the american anthem was saying incredibly slowly so again that, when it comes to just the flow of 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 the broadcast and the live setting and of course you never know what you're going to get live because when things happen live, like you can't script that stuff, but uh, there are things that uh, you can be in control of, and the things that should have been in control were the video reviews. So the Oilers had two goals called back against them, and the St. Louis Blues had a goal upheld in favor of them based on an Oilers challenge. So three challenges uh, went negatively against Edmonton, and... The first one was Evander Kane. Now, the puck hit him up high, kind of near the glove and like the, the shaft of his stick. It went down and it went past Bennington. Uh, that would have given Edmonton an early 1-0 lead in the first period. Now, that goal specifically, it was called no goal on the ice. So that is a very tough goal to overturn because you need clear clear evidence that it was not a high stick and based on the replay angles that we had i don't think there was enough evidence to support overturning the call on the ice and being like yes that is definitively a goal but it was very close in my opinion i feel like that stick and where the puck made contact with the stick was probably right at crossbar level if not just a little bit above so i don't mind that that call didn't go against him or didn't go edmonton's favor but the next review that occurred in the second period uh, was the Zach Kaiman goalie interference on Binnington. Now, this is where things are interesting for me as a fan because Jordan Binnington, we all know his antics on the ice. We know how emotional he is. If he feels like he is ever 
interfered with in any way, shape, or form. He is the first one to either let the players on the ice know, and he'll let the referees know as well. He's very theatrical in his antics, the way he skates around and tries to start things, and he shows his frustration very regularly if he feels like uh, there's something going against him. Now, when Hyman made contact, Bennington's legs were still closed, and then the puck sat in front of him for about one second, and he opened his legs up, and the Nugent Hopkins put the puck under them before he could reclose that five hole. Now, Bennington's reaction on the ice was, uh, looked up to the sky like, oh man, like I messed up. He didn't go to the referees. He didn't try and say that he was interfered with. He didn't even question it on the ice. And for someone like Jordan Bennington, who usually is questioning things on the ice and how things play out, and as I mentioned, just how theatrical he is. The fact that he did not even remotely complain about what happened uh, is very interesting to me because Stuart Skinner on the opposite side, Stuart Skinner is very calm in his net and he very rarely shows emotion other than when a goal is scored against him, but that's just usually internal frustration that kind of comes out like, oh, I should have had that one. But Stuart Skinner is not someone that ever really reacts in a way where he tries to get the ref's attention or his bench at bench's attention, the coaching staff. Uh, when things don't go his way on the ice, he's very, you know, he takes things he's responsible he takes personal responsibility for that and the st louis blues goal shen he immediately it was like the second the puck was in uh stewart skinner immediately was looking at the ref he was pointing over at the oilers bench and showing you know like pointing towards his pad and his like blocker area so his reaction um in contrast with bennington's reaction is something that i wanted to talk about specifically because that it is two goalies with two very different uh mindsets when they're on the ice having completely different reactions, and both calls went against Empton in this situation, which is very interesting. Now, I don't mind that the Hyman goal was called back, or sorry, the Nugent Hopkins goal was called back for the Zach Hyman interference. So the precedent was set on that replay. Now, what frustrates me is if that's not a goal, if Nugent Hopkins' goal does not count, I don't think Shen's goal should have counted either. Now, in my personal opinion, I think both goals should have counted because I like goal scoring and I want to see more of that in the NHL. It is exciting for fans. I think both goals should have stood or both goals should not have counted. But the fact that one counted and one did not is where we get the inconsistency in the officiating, uh, the review system process. And the fact that the NHL War Room doesn't actually put out anything kind of specific explaining why a call was upheld, they are, the only statement they put out is, uh, after review, it was determined there was no goaltender interference, good goal. Or if it, it, you know, like, they don't, you know, they don't have, like, a video explaining why a call was made the way it was. So, one thing that I was uh, showing you guys in the post-game recap last night, I'm going to pull up the picture here, and we're going to get to the uh, next screen grab. Torupchenko on Shen's goal. Now, your stick does not bend like this unless there is a decent amount of force being applied to it, either against the ice or against a player or whatever, an object. Now, based on all the reviews that we had on Braden Shen's goal, this is a situation where Torupchenko's stick is clearly in the pad and blocker area of Skinner. When we looked at the replays, and I've looked at a couple different ones, I can't show the video on my on my video because the NHL will copyright strike my channel, so I have to show stills. Torupchenko's stick is not against the ice at any point when that puck is shot and going towards the net and then in the net. This was taken just before the shot was taken by Shen, and it's very obvious that his stick is pushing into Stuart Skinner's blocker and his and his goal pad. And with that amount of force being applied and how much bend there is in this stick, it's obvious that Skinner was interfered with in this situation. So I've had some fans try and argue, well, Torpchenko's not in the blue paint, so you know that's not goal interference. That's not how the rule is, in my opinion. You can be outside the crease, but if you were, like, putting your stick inside the crease to, like... Like, if you were to, like, spear Stuart Skinner, even though he's not standing in the blue paint, it's still a spearing penalty, right? Now, this is obviously not spearing, but this is interfering with Skinner's ability to react in time to make the save. The puck went through his blocker side, and if this stick contact was not being made, I do feel like Skinner would have saved that. He was in position. He was set to this. He was square. 
he had the angle cut and this is a situation where i'm just still baffled that it was called uh, against the oilers and then, and and that gave st louis another power play so that was a power play goal that shen scored and then the uh losing the coach's challenge you get a delay of game penalty so st louis gets another power play and like the whole the whole game kind of turned at this point in the second period now i'm gonna head back to my regular overlay here um as i mentioned we're just looking for consistency as a fan i don't care that one call went the way it did. I just want them to be consistent in how the calls are, you know, made during a game. If Nugent Hopkins' goal doesn't count, I felt Torp, uh, Brain Chen's goal should not have counted as well. I keep getting Torpchenko and Shen mixed up because I see Torpchenko on the screen, even though Shen was the one that was shooting. Same with Hyman and Nuge. Hyman's one that made contact. It was Nuge's goal. Um, and it's and it's also more frustrating as an Oilers fan because that would have been Nugent Hopkins' first uh, even strength goal in six weeks, which is uh, pretty wild to think about. Uh, Nugent Hopkins has been struggling when it comes to the five on five production, although his on ice metrics are very positive. A lot of this has to do with you know luck, um, you know PDO that sort of thing. But again, just going back to the reviews and as a fan, I just want consistency. If one goal doesn't count, the other one shouldn't have either. Um, if one goal counts, they both should have counted. That's just kind of what I'm looking at. You know, when it, like I understand the logic of both calls that were made. However, I don't really agree with the Torpchenko and Shen goal like at all. Like that that that's the one where as a fan of the Oilers, it is uh, a tough pill to swallow. But we're going to move on from that. That is just my thoughts, and I kind of want to know yours as well. A lot of you gave your feedback on my video last night, which was great. Uh, if any of you that didn't tune into that video, please let me know what you thought of the reviews in the game last night in the comments. Now, next uh, player or topic that I want to talk about is Leon Dreisaitl. I thought he had a very tough game. That was one of his worst games in quite a while, honestly. Uh, he took two really bad penalties. One gave St. Louis a five on three, and then another one that gave the Blues a four on three power play. Now, luckily, the penalty kill came up clutch. Stuart Skinner made saves. Uh, Henrik, CC, Ekholm, um, you know, Nugent Hopkins, they all made good plays on these penalty kills to kill those penalties. But Dry Settle, even though he did score a goal, he scored with about five and a half minutes left in the third to tie the game. Uh, I felt his passing was off. I felt you know, he he was having one of those games where there's a lot of attitude on the ice. He takes a penalty. He's banging his stick on the ice. He he was not having a good game. Uh, his his advanced metrics were very positive, but in terms of his on ice impacts, uh, they were not positive in my opinion. That's a game where you hope that doesn't happen in the playoffs because if Drysaddle gets that frustrated against the St. Louis Blues in uh, in an early April regular season matchup, like this is garbage time for the Oilers. We know they're a playoff team. Uh, if Drysaddle is getting like this against, you know, if he if he's losing his his mental strength on the ice against the Blues, um, it's not going to be uh, hard for teams to get under his skin in the playoffs. So hopefully Leon Dreisaitl, he bounces back against the Dallas Stars, which I have no doubt that he will. Leon Dreisaitl is a very good player. Whenever he has a, a stinker game like this, he usually bounces back and has a, an amazing game the next night. So but I'm not worried about Dreisaitl, but it was something that I wanted to talk about. You know, I talk about, you know, players like CC or Kane or Carrick or Brown, like when they have bad games, uh, it's only fair that I go after some of the big guys, the big guns as well. And Leon Dreisaitl did not have a good game. He also only won four faceoffs, and I think he lost 10 or 11. So his 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 night on the faceoff dot was also not good either. Um, so hopefully Dreisaitl can bounce back. Now, the next thing I want to talk about was officiating. Now, I don't believe that there's a conspiracy that there are specific teams or players that get the calls and teams that don't. I don't think the league has it out for anyone specifically. I just think officiating is bad in general. Now, uh, I don't think there's any perceived bias, but one thing I wanted to mention, and why am I going to talk about the officials if I don't think there's any kind of uh, intense bias? The last two times Empton has played in St. Louis the two games they played in St. Louis this season. The power plays ended up being 12 to 5 in favor of the Blues. So the Blues had seven more power plays in two games, which is interesting because usually power plays are pretty even in most games. Uh, if one team gets three power plays, the other team usually will have two or four. It's very rare that you have a difference of two or more in a game. Uh, last night, St. Louis had four, M10 had two, and then the last time they met, St. Louis had eight power plays, and the Oilers had three in St. Louis, and that was the game where the Oilers had, I think, seven straight minor penalties called against them, which, again, you just you rarely ever see that in today's NHL. Refs keep things close. Uh, game management, I guess you can call it. 
Well, so why am I talking about it? Well, because the St. Louis Blues are the most penalized team in the NHL. They have some of the worst possess possession metrics, so it would make sense that if you're chasing the game a lot, if you're chasing the puck a lot, you're more likely to commit an infraction. Now, in saying that, how did they end up with seven more power plays over a two-game stretch against the Oilers in St. Louis? That's what I want to know, because this is where officiating and the inconsistencies bother me as a fan. I just don't understand how that's even possible. The Oilers are 31st in the league in power play time on ice per game, and they are 8th in penalty kill time on ice per game, but they have the best expected goals for in the NHL at even strength. They have the best shot metrics, or one of the best shot metrics. They constantly control the flow of the game, the pace of the game at even strength. So how is it that Edmonton is being called for so many penalties against, and not getting the benefit of the calls when they are on offense, especially against the St. Louis Blues, who do chase the game a lot. They are not a good possession team, and they are the most penalized team in the NHL. However, against the Oilers, they seem to get the benefit of all the calls on the ice. And uh, as a fan of the Oilers, it is frustrating. I don't like it. And we know it's going to get even worse because once the playoffs start, just the calls in general, the, the power plays end up even in the playoffs usually, but it's what's not called that drives me crazy, or it is what is called compared to what isn't. So I guess this is just preparing us for the playoffs, but it is something I wanted to mention. Now, before we get to the end of the video, I did just want to take a quick look at the NHL standings. We can all take a look at this together. I'm just going to pull them up on the screen. We'll take a look and see where everyone is here. Now, the Oilers, they are five points back of the Canucks. They still have a game in hand on them So and a head-to-head -head matchup. So theoretically, if the Oilers were to win that game in hand and then win the head-to-head -head in regulation, you could say Empton is only one point back of Vancouver. Um, I do think that it is unlikely that Empton wins the division. Uh, if they did, they would probably play, uh, who would it be? Probably Nashville, it looks like, would be that wildcard team. However, St. Louis has gotten themselves right back in this. They're only three points back of the Kings, and the Kings are spiraling right now. They lost three games in a row in regulation. Could you imagine if St. Louis came back and found a way to overtake the Kings? Golden Knights, it looks like their playoff positioning is being solidified here. They're 7-2-1 in their last 10. Uh, that could be a round one matchup, and we all know what's going to happen on day one of the playoffs with the Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, Tomash Hurdle is going to be ready to go. Mark Stone might be ready to go, although I'm not as uh, confident in Mark Stone being able to go for Vegas. If it is true and his spleen was lacerated a month or two ago, I can't foresee him being back even in round one of the playoffs. That probably wouldn't be until like May or June, but again, that's a situation where I don't know. It just doesn't make sense. But Vegas, you know, they don't get the benefit of the doubt when it comes to player injuries because of how things have played out in the past with them. Uh, I do think Edmonton has the better team, and I do think head-to-head -head, Edmonton matches up better against Vegas. What it'll come down to is the goaltending. But in terms of uh, playoff positioning, I do believe the Oilers' magic number is down to three after last night, but someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, they are 13 points up on the Blues with do, 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 while they have nine games left the blues have a, uh, eight games left seven games left seven games left so 14 so i think if empton wins they just need to win in regulation i'm pretty sure and that'll that that should prevent them from ever being able to drop below st louis in the standings um so yeah just taking a look at that and then if we want to take a look out east if you guys want uh the boston's first in the atlantic although 15 overtime losses that's outrageous florida's second in the division uh, you might have a florida toronto matchup in the first round however toronto's been playing really good hockey lately florida has not you could see toronto overtake florida possibly but again it'll be interesting and the metro division wolf malone this this division is horrible when we look at the metro division uh the philadelphia flyers they're third in the division but they have a negative 17 goal differential like what on earth is that and then the washington capitals have the second wild card position and they have a negative 31 goal differential and then the islanders are only three points back of washington but they have a negative 28 goal differential so uh metro division it's between the rangers and hurricanes to move on and um when we get into the playoffs and in the atlantic uh detroit they could they could you know get back in but 
the games in hand are in Washington's favor here. Uh, very interesting playoff races, very interesting teams that are in the playoffs this season. Uh, I look at a team like Nashville, which I thought would, are, are on the cusp of a rebuild. Now, they have lost two in a row, but they did go 18 straight without losing in regulation. So that's super interesting to me. Um, I know this is an Oilers channel, but I do like just taking a look at other NHL teams as well. That's pretty much it for me today, though. Uh, I do appreciate you tuning in to the day after discussion videos. They do mean a lot. Your support is very much uh, appreciated. If you want to see more of these videos, uh, make sure you hit like. If you really like this video today, make sure you hit subscribe. Uh, share it around if you'd like. If you know Oilers fans that might be interested in videos like this, uh, sharing these videos goes a long way as well. Um, yeah, so tomorrow uh, my video will be a pregame report between the Oilers and Stars, which I am looking forward to. That's going to be a very good measuring stick game for Edmonton. And then, of course, tomorrow night after the game, I do my postgame recaps. Now, the game tomorrow, it says it'll be 7.30 p.m. Mountain, but uh, Jack Michaels on the broadcast was saying that that puck drop won't be until about 7.50 p.m. So a bit of a late game for uh, Edmonton. So uh, big, big fan of that. Love that. Definitely won't be sleepy. Um, but that's pretty much it for me today. Let me know all of your thoughts about the game last night or this video in general in the comment section below. I love constructive feedback. I love reading all of your comments. Um, a lot of them are really funny. A lot of them are very constructive. I do like engaging with everyone. So thank you so much again. Make sure you hit like. Make sure you hit subscribe. Tell somebody that you love them today. Have a wonderful, wonderful Tuesday. And I'll see you tomorrow in the pregame report. Take care. Thanks for watching.